बार फिर से आप सभी का बहुत स्वागत है बिहार की मिथिला कला को आगे बढ़ाने में उनके विदेशी संस्थानों का बहुत महत्व है जिन्होंने न केवल मिथिला कला को विदेशों में प्रमोट किया बल्कि हमारे कलाकारों और उनकी कलाओं को अलग अलग माध्यमों में डॉक्यूमेंट भी किया फिल्में भी उनमें से एक है टॉकी सीरीज में आज ऐसी ही एक फिल्म मिथिला पेंटर फाइव विलेज आर्टिस्ट फ्रॉम मधुबनी इंडिया ई ए एफ की सौजन्य से ये फिल्म हमारे आज के दिन की आखिरी प्रस्तुति है इससे पहले जो कुछ भी आपने देखा है सुना है वो सब कुछ पाचवन और पाचू के नाम से हमारे यूट्यूब चैनल फुकाटू पीडिया पर भी उपलब्ध रहेगा संभव है कि कुछ वीडियो तकनीकी कारणों से हटा भी लिए जाए इसीलिए आप सारी वीडियो जरूर देखें तो आज के लिए बस इतना ही कल हम फिर मिलेंगे और भी कई सारे परफॉर्मेंसेज के साथ तब तक के लिए मुझे दीजिए इजाजत नमस्कार A region bound by common language and folklore, known in the past as Mithila or Madhubani, meaning honey forest, today spans portions of northern India and eastern Nepal. Historically, this region has been regarded as the land of the goddess Sita, divine heroine of the Hindu epic tale the Ramayan. Over the years. The villagers of Mithila developed a distinctive form of folk painting on the walls and floors of their village homes. This painting has special significance for women and women's readiness for marriage. During a drought in the 1960s, famine relief workers arrived in Mithila and recognized the paintings for their income earning potential. They urged the villagers to make their wall and floor paintings on large pieces of heavy handmade paper. They could be sold commercially. Since then, the lives of the villagers, and especially of the village painters, have been changed. All five village painters we are about to meet follow the main conventions of Mithila painting. Within these main conventions, certain castes follow their own traditions, and each painter has favorite themes and stories, and paints them in unique, individual styles and colors. <laughs> of all the Mithila painters, the Mahapatra Brahman widow Sita Devi is the one most widely recognized outside in the rest of India. For the past twelve years. She has spent about half her time painting in Delhi. Once great palaces like that of Rajnagar, now in ruins near Sita Devi's village, patronized the arts. Today, it is often luxury hotels like the Akbar in Delhi that serve that function and supplement the income Mithila painters earn through their Master Craftsmen's Association and their many buyers in India. And around the world. In December 1981, Sita Devi and her son and helper Surya Dev were visiting the Akbar Hotel's Madhuban room, which is adorned with their paintings. So, what are the subjects of the paintings here in the Madhuban room? Here are ten boards depicting ten deities. Here are ten other boards depicting flowers. Another ten boards depict animals, though not all were installed here. And what is this picture? It is a picture of Ardhana Rishvara, a divine half woman, half man. This is the deity that has rewarded our hard work. We people have also undergone long periods of self-denial and discipline. This is how prosperity has come to us. Today, our painting has given our children an education, and has brought us some financial security. The more I concentrate on my painting, the more I am rewarded. We have founded an organization in Madhubani called the Master Craftsmen Association, whose symbol is the Ardhana Rishwara. 
This is all the result of God's blessing. What's the large painting behind the bar? When Lord Indra sent the devastating rains on Gokula, Lord Krishna raised Gobardhan Mountain on the tip of his little finger like a giant umbrella. All the people and animals of Gokula sought shelter under Krishna's giant umbrella and worshipped him, just as those rains brought havoc to Gokula. So droughts have often brought havoc to Mithila. It was during such a drought in the 1960s that Bhaskar Kulkarni arrived and began buying Mithila paintings. And when my son and I first came to Delhi. Sita Devi and her son Surya Dev soon became international travelers. In 1976, they visited East Germany and America. Shortly after their return to Jitwarpur, Sita Devi was heard to say, After I die, I may go to heaven. But my goodness, America is heaven. And I have come back to Jitwarpur to talk about America. When asked to describe what most impressed her about America, Sita Devi first showed her picture of New York City's World Trade Center and another picture of her riding in an elevator with the New Yorker. Another painting Sita Devi made in America was of Arlington National Cemetery. Coming from one of the most densely populated land-poor regions of the world, Sita Devi was impressed by how much land was covered by the cemetery. She was also impressed that information about each person in Arlington Cemetery was recorded on a separate headstone. The trip that impressed Sita Devi most was not her visit to America, but her visit to the home of India's then Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi. She asked me to come and sent her social secretary to the hotel with a car to bring Surya Dev and me to her residence. Then Mrs. Gandhi asked me to do a painting and I had only two colors with me, red and green, some paper, and a matchstick I use as a brush. While I worked, Mrs. Gandhi and her son Rajiv Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi watched. And what painting did you make? I painted the powerful goddess Durga. She's one of my favorites. I often paint her. Then Mrs. Gandhi asked me to color the painting. When I had finished, she asked what I wanted to do with the painting, I said I wanted to give it to her. Indeed, I ended up giving my painting of the powerful goddess Durga to another powerful Durga. Another important picture of the powerful goddess Durga was painted by Sita Devi and her son Surya Dev on the walls of the permanent village exhibit complex in New Delhi. Since the paints they use are impermanent indigenous colors, they wash away in the rain. Sita Devi and Surya Dev retouch the wall paintings each time they are in New Delhi. It looks like a village house. Yes, it does. And what is this picture? It's a picture of Durga. And what's on this side? It's the goddess Lakshmi. And there, on that wall? There's the whole family of Shiva. Shiva himself with his matted hair, his bull, and his elephant-headed son. Ganesh. What picture is that? That is the demon Ravan in the Ramayan capturing the goddess Sita. That's a picture of an elephant in which each part of the elephant is a gopi milkmaid. And that's a picture of Lord Krishna dancing with the gopi milkmaids in such a way that each one felt he danced only with her. And here is another painting of Krishna dancing with the gopi milkmaids. This one, however, was not painted by Sita Devi. It was painted by Ganga Devi using her usual line painting, a style of painting more characteristic of women of the Kayas castes than women of other castes. Ganga Devi, perhaps the most renowned and respected of all Mithila painters, is also the most religious. She is the only major painter to have taken initiation from a Boisnab guru. Today, it's hard to appreciate how desperately poor Ganga Devi was before she began painting. Ganga Devi had a happy childhood 
which she has recalled in an autobiographical painting. When I was a child, I used to play with my girl doll. In fact, I painted two Kobar marriage wall designs on the wall for my girl doll. I learned to do all the pictures associated with a wedding, the Kobar marriage wall design, the bamboo god, the tantric lady. I became skilled at making clay lamps, horses, and elephants. First, my elder sister and I, and later, just I myself, came to be in great demand for making all the things associated with a wedding. Sometimes I'd spend up to six months preparing for a wedding. But when it was time for my own wedding, my luck ran out. I was no beauty queen, and that seemed more important than my skill or character. My family was quite prosperous, but that didn't help either. Finally, I was married. My brother had tried hard to get me a good husband, but he was not successful. When I went to my husband's village, I was pained to see the miserable condition of his household. It was hard to get even one full meal a day. Gunga Devi's poor nutrition hampered her ability to bear children. After seven years of marriage, she had borne only one child, a daughter, who had died after a few months. So her husband, following the local custom, made arrangements to marry a second wife. Gunga Devi fasted for a month on the banks of the Ganges River to prevent her husband's second marriage. When she failed, she went to her guru. He advised her to stay in the marriage as a co-wife and to take up painting. When her husband's second wife moved in, Gunga Devi was initially treated as a household servant. But within one year of starting to paint, she received the National Award for Master Craftsman. The income from her painting brought her respect. And in time, her co-wife's son became her companion. One day, Ganga Devi walked from her home in Rashidpur to Jitwarpur to attend a meeting of the Master Craftsmen's Association. I remember every detail of that day. As I was leaving the village, I saw two women carrying pitchers of water on their heads. I discovered a nut by an orchard. I found windfall mangoes beside the road. I saw farmers plowing and harvesting in the fields, and a fisherman catching small fish in a flooded field. As I walked along, every inch of space seemed to be taken up. I passed domes herding goats. I looked up and saw a toddy tree tapper at work, and I was reminded of the palm trees I had seen in Moscow as ornaments outside a hotel. When I was traveling on a bus in Moscow, I saw a hotel that from a distance looked like a palm tree. I was surprised to see many electric lights and people taking food and going up in elevators. I tried to make a picture of it. When they told me I was going to Moscow, they asked me to make another painting. I recall how some of the low caste people in my village gave me food when I was almost starving, before I began to paint. So I painted the story of Sabri from the Ramayan. Sabri was a low caste woman to whom it was foretold she would one day receive Lord Ram. Much time passed. She was in her late forties when Lord Ram and his brother Lakshman finally appeared. She had nothing to give them but some wild bale fruit. These are sometimes very sour, so she tasted each one before offering it to them. She thereby polluted each fruit. But Ram and his brother ate the bale fruits because she was pure of heart. The low caste neighbor woman who saved me in my dark days now comes to me almost daily for my blessing. She says, you have suffered so much and succeeded. You must be a great soul. <laughs> Award winners like Gunga Devi bring their finished paintings to the Master Craftsmen's Association office in Jitwarpur. Here they receive reimbursement for their paintings sold at foreign exhibitions. Be sure it's right. It should be 1400 The bearded gentleman sitting by the table is Krishnanan Jha, treasurer of the Master Craftsmen's Association and also one of its most important painters. <laughs> 
Krishnanan Jha comes from one of the renowned tantric families in the region. He and many other young men studied with his revered father. Krishnanan Jha recalls in his paintings how as a youth he was shaved, then he bathed, put on the sacred thread, and took up the life of a tantric student, focusing on the female forms of divine power. When my family first arrived here, about 600 years ago, we owned seven villages. By the time I was born, we owned only a few dozen acres. I decided I should earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in order to support myself. So I finished college. But after an intense search, I could find no employment. So, in disgust, I threw my diploma in the river and became a painter. In so doing, Krishnanan Jha was returning to his heritage, for his father, from the time he was a child, had painted pictures as part of his tantric studies. Krishnanan Jha's painting of the tantric deity Chinamasta illustrates the story of Parvati beheading herself and then springing to life again as divine creator, preserver, and destroyer. Among the first paintings Bhaskar Kulkarni purchased in the 1960s were some by Krishnanan Jha's father, who subsequently earned a lot of money from his paintings until his eyesight began to fail. Now he paints only as a part of tantric worship. Then Krishnanan Jha started to paint. In Krishnanan Jha's home, one sees a close relationship between tantrism and paintings by women. In fact, some scholars believe the Mithila painting originated in the 7th century from tantric household practices in nearby Nepal. When I first began in the mid-1970s, I painted primarily tantric themes the ten forms of the mother goddess Kali, or her tantric symbols, and the goddess Mohakali, whose many limbs dramatize her many powers. Later, when I was assured of a market, I branched out to illustrate events from the famous epic, the Ramayan, Ram, Lakshman, and Sita wandering in the forest, Sita's abduction by the villain Ravana, and so forth. Once, I even painted a condensed version of the Ramayan on a single large panel. To the left lies the villain Ravana, mortally wounded, conveying, in his last moments, his views on statecraft to Lakshman, Ram's brother. Though Krishnanan Jha does not fully follow such tantric precepts as wearing red clothing, he is still impressed by what his father taught him. For example, recently, when a young boy of the village was murdered, Krishnanan Jha played a key role in seeing that justice was done. The murder case began in the late 1970s, when the mutilated body of Fulja, a 16-year-old relative of Sita Devi, was pulled from a well. In a village, there are few secrets. It was well known that young Fulja had become involved with a youthful gang of smugglers from an adjacent village led by the son of the village headman. Fulja had bragged to the gang that he could arrange a tryst with a pretty girl from his village, but he failed. To punish him, the gang compelled him to lie on the ground, placed a pole across his neck, and strangled him by sitting on the pole till he choked to death. Then they mutilated his body, and after dark, dumped the weighted body in what they thought was an abandoned well. However, the well had not been abandoned. The body of the murdered boy was retrieved from the well. An uncle recognized the dead boy and summoned the police. The police made a serious investigation. A tracking dog was brought in and given a sniff of Fulcha's sandals in Jitwarpur and told to search. He took off along the path witnesses had seen Fulja take, right to the house of the village headman. The handler called search, and the tracking dog hurled himself at the headman's door, the last place to which Fulja had gone on foot. The crowd cheered. There must have been close to 150 people following after the police. The headman himself was alleged to have personally murdered at least six people and never been prosecuted. The headman, his son, and the gang were all taken to jail. 
Then followed eight years of court delays. Throughout this entire period, Krishnan and Jha convinced witnesses they should come forward, defended them when the accused lodged false court cases against them, kept up their spirits when they were threatened, all the while supporting himself by his paintings. Finally, after eight years, there was a session trial in Madhubani court. The accused were found guilty. The impact on the community was tremendous. The villagers were overjoyed that justice had been done. The verdict was later reversed when the case was appealed to state court, 100 miles away, too far for the numerous witnesses to travel. Nevertheless, the villagers felt that by pulling together, they had won a victory. Together, they had been able to bring some of the most powerful people in the village to justice. Many months later, when Krishnan and Cha was asked why he had played such an important role in the murder case, he explained, My father used to say, a Brahmin should always serve as a model for others to follow. I did merely what my father taught me to do. Krishnan Jha has lived a life different from that of his father. He paints for a living, and he is the treasurer of the Master Craftsman's Association. Nevertheless, his village neighbors agree that he has lived up to the stature of his father. Om Kama Phalant Viranam Joginam Jogasattaya Rajanu Dharmika Santu Another Mithila religious leader who has important influence on painting is Ram Swarup. Ram Swarup is a renowned shaman and healer of the low caste Dutads. He is also a famous storyteller whose accounts of local low caste deities are usually sung while being accompanied by a chorus of clappers. Seated behind Ram Swarup is his daughter-in-law Shanti Devi who is preparing natural colors from flower petals. Shanti Devi, when she first began painting as a young bride of 16, did not illustrate the low caste deities in her father-in-law's stories. Rather, she painted deities from the overarching Hindu tradition, such as the goddess Kali and the god Shiva though in a powerfully original style. Eventually, Shanti Devi was convinced that she could sell paintings of low caste deities as well. Her early paintings of Lord Salhesh, the major deity of the Dusad caste, looked a great deal like her earlier representations of the god Shiva. In colonial times, the British classified the Dusads as a criminal caste engaged in highway robbery. In those days, Mithila was a land of lonely roads and of jungles filled with deer and tigers. A hunter with a gun could easily be mistaken for a highwayman. Shanti Devi's paintings began to reflect that vanished world. Those were the days when Lord Salhesh brought comfort to his Dusad followers by manifesting himself omnipotently in every flower and tree. Shanti Devi never seemed to borrow directly from any other painters, but she learned from them all. She developed a unique ability to handle complex subject matter on large panels, such as the interwoven life episodes of the members of Salhesh's family and the variety of forms in which Lord Salhesh appears. Shanti Devi's mother was widowed when Shanti Devi was only a few years old. Her mother supported herself and her children by breaking bricks into chips to use as road gravel and by working as a servant in the home of a Brahmin lady. One day, the Brahmin lady asked, why aren't your children in school? Shanti Devi's mother replied that she thought schools were only for upper caste children, not Dusad children. The Brahmin lady assured her that her children could go to school even though they were Dusads. So Shanti Devi's mother sent her and her brother to school and turned down several remarriage proposals to be sure they remained in school. As a result, Shanti Devi managed to complete high school and she became one of the most highly educated painters in Mithila. 
When Shanti Devi grew up, she took a keen interest in politics. Her painting of the November 1980 midterm election shows processions, candidates with loudspeakers on platforms and in a jeep, and voters showing their preferences for party symbols printed on flags and ballots. Many of my ideas of what to paint come from my father-in-law. He tells stories, he sings songs, and I picture those things in my mind, and then I paint them. The story of Govind Maharaj has special importance for members of the low caste Dusads. They believe Govind Maharaj to be a manifestation of Krishna, the Lord who plays the flute and is adored by peacocks and cows, as illustrated here in a painting by Shanti Devi. In ancient times, Dayans ruled the world and kept a careful watch on anyone who threatened their power. Dayans were women who practiced secret magic for evil purposes. In those days, a queen gave birth to a wondrous son, Karak. When Karak was three days old, the queen rocked him in a beautiful cradle that hung from the sky. But alas, the beautiful cradle caught the attention of the Dayans, and they brought it crashing to the ground. When the Dayans saw the wondrous baby sleeping in the cradle, they could tell that if he grew up, he would threaten their power. So they snatched him out of the cradle and imprisoned him in a cage composed of all kinds of living poisonous snakes. The devastated queen began to die of grief, but the god, Govind Maharaj, appeared to her and consoled her. He assured her that another child would be born to her on the evening of the second day. Then, unknown to the queen, the god, Govind Maharaj himself, entered her womb as a baby ready to be born. Sure enough, on the second day, the queen began to have labor pains. She sent a servant to fetch the midwife from a neighboring village. The midwife, who was a Dayan, insisted she be carried all the way to the queen on a palanquin. By the time the palanquin had been arranged for and the midwife had arrived, and gotten down from the palanquin, the baby had already been born. When the newborn baby, who was really the god, Govind Maharaj, saw the midwife, he announced, Be careful, she is a Dayan. Amazed, the Dayan midwife lied to the queen. You have given birth to a Kama demon. Before the neighbors learn of this and spread rumors about you, put this Kama demon into a box and deposit it in the Ganges River. The Dayan midwife then bribed the royal astrologer to support her false story. The royal astrologer assured the king that the baby was a Kama and had to be disposed of. With profound sorrow, the king placed his baby in a box and carried the box to the Ganges River. The queen of the Ganges retrieved the box, rescued the baby, and with great delight adopted the baby. The queen of the Ganges raised Govind Maharaj training him in the classical wisdoms as well as in the arts of hunting and warfare. The sage Vyas found the empty box in the Ganges River. When he touched it, the sage turned into a people tree, sacred to Govind Maharaj. Shanti Devi has also illustrated less well-known adventures of Krishna, or Govind Maharaj, such as the time he and two of his companions returned on horseback to the land of his birth to attack the Dayans and free his brother Karik from the cage of poisonous snakes. Shanti Devi uses her considerable income as a painter to send her children to an English medium school. She herself is studying privately for her BA. She and her artist husband have both received National Master Craftsman's Awards and the Indian government is building them a brick house, the first brick house in their low caste neighborhood. Gaini parayele Ahana umata barake Crucial sources of inspiration for Mithila painters are the hundreds of songs and stories known by most villagers, many of them about snakes. One of the most outstanding storytellers is Boa Devi. She recently received a National Master Craftsman's Award for her story illustrations. Boa Devi was asked to recount and illustrate one of her favorite snake stories. One day, two young boys, for their amusement, were throwing rocks at a pair of small cobras. 
They scurried near a young wife scrubbing her metal pots down by the pond. She pitied the snakes and tipped over two metal pots to protect them. Then she sent the two boys on their way. When they had gone, she lifted the pots. To her surprise, the snake spoke to her. Young woman, we are most grateful that you have saved our lives, and we would like to repay you. We know you are an orphan girl. Though you are married, you have no family to whom you can return on special days. Let us become your family, for we can assume human form, and we have a substantial house. On the next special day, we will return in our human form to fetch you. The young wife, quite bemused by the prospect, agreed. The two snake brothers had a somewhat harder time selling their idea to their own family. The mother snake was immediately receptive. She appreciated the fact that her son's lives had been saved, and she rather liked the idea of a daughter coming to visit. But the father snake was a problem. He was so full of poison that he was unwilling to change into human form, despite his son's entreaties. Finally, the mother prevailed. She got the father to agree to curl up in some remote corner of the house on the next special day and let the mother and sons extend hospitality in their human forms to the young wife. When the next special day arrived, the two snake brothers assumed human form and set out to fetch their sister. They greeted their sister, who was both startled and pleased that things had worked out as promised. The young wife washed the dust from her brother's feet and arranged for them to take rest, while she prepared a meal for them and made sweets to take with her to her family home. Her brothers arranged a palanquin to take their sister home. Safe above the muddy road, borne in a palanquin by four strong men, the young wife had a very pleasant journey home. Following tradition, the young wife wept when she greeted her mother. Her mother displayed an earthen lamp to ward off evil spirits and washed her daughter's feet. And then, of course, the young wife washed her mother's feet and they embraced. The mother prepared a special meal for her daughter. The only household work the mother allowed her to do was to light the earthen lamp at night before the household deities. Every evening the daughter lit the earthen lamp and placed it on what she thought was a lampstand before the family deity. The lampstand, however, was actually the head of the coiled-up father cobra. Each evening when the daughter placed the lighted earthen lamp on the father cobra's head, it not only assaulted his dignity, it also burnt him. Finally, the father cobra lost his patience. This is too much, he exclaimed. Not only am I treated like a lampstand, I'm also burnt on my head. I shall settle my score with that young wife with one fatal bite. The snake mother and sons were horrified at the father cobra's deadly threat. They pleaded with him, she cannot die while a guest in our house, for that will bring dishonor to our family. Reluctantly, the father cobra agreed to wait till she was back in her husband's house before he killed her. The distressed mother thought of a plan that might possibly save her daughter's life. The day before her daughter left to return to her husband's house, her mother instructed her, back in your husband's home every evening after you've eaten, you must change your clothes, fry a little rice, add milk, and place it on leaves at your front door and in the middle and four corners of your room. The mother knew, as does everyone in Mithila, that fried rice mixed with milk is the favorite food of cobras. Having placed the food, you should recite the following prayer for the long life of your family. King Cobra, bearer of sparkling gems, come into my house and fill it with precious stones. May my father, mother, uncles, aunts, and all their children prosper, for it is by their blessing that I eat milk and rice in a golden cup. Then clap your hands three times and say, O oh, saint, make it so, make it so. On the last day of their sister's visit, her brothers bought her a new sari and gave it to her as a farewell present. 
Her mother combed her daughter's hair in preparation for her journey back to her husband's house and made sweets for her daughter to give to her in-laws. The time arrived for the final leave-taking. The traditional tears and weeping were enhanced for the mother by her secret fears for her daughter's life. As the daughter got into the palanquin, her mother admonished her, Be sure to follow my advice carefully. The palanquin took the young wife back to her husband's house. That evening, the young wife, after she had eaten and changed her clothes, fried some rice, mixed it with milk, and placed a little at the front door and in the middle and four corners of the room. In the meantime, the father cobra, despite the mother's entreaties, had set out across the countryside to kill the young wife. As the father cobra slithered into the young wife's house, intent on killing her, he spotted his favorite food, fried rice and milk, at the door and in the center and in the corners of the room. By the time he had eaten all of it, he felt pretty good. He then heard his daughter recite the prayer her mother had taught her. King Cobra, bearer of sparkling gems, come into my house and fill it with precious stones. May my father, mother, uncles, aunts, and all their children prosper, for it is by their blessing that I eat milk and rice in a golden cup. The father cobra then heard his daughter clap her hands three times and say, O oh, saint, make it so, make it so. The snake father then said, What a fool I have been to take offense at this young woman who only wishes the best for me and my whole family. She wishes to eat milk and rice from a golden cup. Let it be so. Since snakes are the guardians of the precious stone treasures of the earth, the snake father filled his daughter's house with sparkling gems and then slipped quietly away to his home village. The treasure the young wife received is similar to the treasure Boa Devi has received through her devotion to art. Boa Devi's paintings, including her paintings of snakes, paid for all the gifts for her first daughter's wedding, one of the costliest and most elaborate weddings the village has ever seen. Now when I sit and paint, I become very sad. My first daughter's marriage was arranged when she was so young. My earnings came too late to give her an education. All I could give her were beautiful gifts. It gives me great satisfaction to pay for my second daughter's English school education. I hope that someday she can get a good job and earn a large salary. Her father is annoyed that she is continuing her studies. But I am insisting on it. Besides, I am paying for it, and I will someday benefit from it. All the Mithila painters have their ups and downs, their good times and their bad but none reflect their moods in their paintings as clearly as does Boa Devi. One day, a painting was found in the back of her house of a very dour moon god. Boa Devi was asked about her situation at the time she painted the picture. At that time, I was very sad. I wasn't getting enough food to eat. My mind was disturbed. My moon god was weeping. Only painting such as that one came from my brush. Today, things are different. I am filled with joy, and I suppose that joy shows in this recent painting I did of the moon god. On the sixth day of the lunar month of Kartik, which usually occurs in November, villagers in Mithila celebrate Chait, one of their most important festivals. Chait is a time for family reunions and for wearing new clothes. It is also a time for fulfilling vows and worshiping the sun and moon. During the preceding year, married women may vow that if the gods grant them some boon, 
restore a family member to health, provide a generous harvest, and so forth, that married woman will make an offering to the gods and will worship the sun and moon at the next Chait festival. The morning before Chait, married women who have made such vows begin to fast. That afternoon, those married women, carrying bamboo trays holding coconuts, fruits, and sugar cane, stand in a body of water and watch the sun set. The next morning before dawn, those married women return to stand in the water with their bamboo trays again and wait for the sun to rise. The sun rises on an unforgettable scene of celebration with children lighting sparklers, ritual objects on the shores, and priests and specialists repeating prayers. Only after the sun has risen do the married women come out of the water, feed Brahmins, break their fasts, and join the festivities. This painting by Boa Devi shows her representation of a Chait festival sunrise.